Let me introduce myself again to you, remind you that you are participating in the North Dakota Envirothon Aquatics Wednesday. Uh, my name is Tina Harding and I am the Water Resource Education Program Manager, really long title, uh, and I do that for the North Dakota Department of Water Resources. My uh, cohort is Benita Roswick. She's not able to be with us today, but you did hear from her last week and you can expect to hear from her the next uh, presentation we do. So let's get started. So, so far we've been talking about what is a watershed. Um, we've talked about chemical and physical properties of watershed. Now today we're going to dive into the watershed ecology. Now, like I said, this means there's going to be a lot of terminology thrown at you. Uh, don't worry about getting all these definitions down. We'll make sure that you have them by the end of the presentation. So let's just review what is a watershed. It's an area of land in which water drains sediment and dissolved materials to a common receiving body or an outlet. Remember that everybody on this earth lives in a watershed. We don't all live in the same watershed, but we all live in a watershed. So what is watershed ecology? Well, it's basically studying watersheds and the ecosystems that uh, interact with it, interacting on a biotic and abiotic components. Ah, there's two terms that if we haven't said those before, you're going to hear them a lot today. And then lastly, what is ecosystems? Uh, it's the functioning natural unit where interacting biotic and abiotic components in a system whose boundaries are determined by a cycles and flux of energy, materials and organisms. Going to hear a little bit more about that too. So why are we studying this? Why do we even care? Well, believe it or not, like I said, we all live in a watershed. So it's crucial for people to understand how watersheds operate and how they work before they make any decisions or actions that may impact or affect how a water function, watershed functions, okay? And we need to learn about more useful natural processes in a watershed to keep getting the benefits of those processes while avoiding harm to themselves or their property. All right, that's a lot to unpackage right there, but let's let's keep moving on. All right, so uh, what is a watershed? What are the elements of a watershed we're gonna talk about today? Uh, we're gonna start out with talking about the basic ecosystems. We're gonna move on to the ecological dynamics of a watershed, and then lastly, the terrestrial ecosystems. So what are the basic ecology? Well, let's start with a simple dichotomy. If we look around us, there are two basic types of living things. You have plants and animals. Most plants are considered producers, organisms which can produce their own food using the sun as a source of energy to manufacture that food, also known as photosynthesis. These are all terms you probably have heard already. Most animals are considered consumers, organisms which are dependent on producers or other consumers as a source for their food. The majority of producers are green plants using chlorophyll. And plants have the ability to photosynthesize or produce what we call carbohydrates, utilizing sunshine as the primary energy source and are recognized to the, most of us as algaes, mosses, ferns, grasses, forbs, shrubs, trees, the list goes on. For the most part, organisms are all dependent on sunlight for energy. Now, if we look at energy, or if we look at um, basic ecology as an economic system of givers and takers, users, uh, producers and consumers, energy would be considered that, uh, would be considered the currency of that economic system. So keep that in the back of your mind as we're talking about that. So uh, remember, these organisms are all dependent on that sunlight for energy, okay? So really the sun controls that currency. Consumers may include bacteria, mammals, fish, birds, insects, snails, and so on. All are dependent on consuming some other organism for that energy. Ecology often involves the study of systems, hence the term ecosystems. A system is an aggregate of things forming a complex whole that are tied together in, by a relationship. And these systems 
are made up of a hierarchy of interconnecting relationships, such as in a food web. For example, some of the food web relationships, let's say we have a population of coyotes, and those coyotes feed on a population of field mice that consume fruits and grasses. The inter energy and genetic relationships between these different organisms is the heart of ecology. All right, let's move on to ecological structures. You're gonna hear terms like biome, ecosystems, community, population, individual organisms. And then I'm gonna go into some of the ecological concepts, a little bit more about the food chain or a food web, you decide. Carrying capacity, competition, and symbiosis. All right, let's get started on that. So this one is gonna, I'm gonna start off by giving you definitions. So what is a biome? A biome are the Earth's distinct ecological regions. The names of terrestrial biomes are named by their dominant plant life. For an example, a grassland. What would you expect the prominent plant life to be? Or a forest, or a shrub, or a tropical forest even. Generally, water bodies are considered an integral part of each of those biomes. Okay, so it's important to understand that you're usually defined by the plant life, but it also has a water component to it. What is an ecosystem? An ecosystem is made up of individuals or groups of different plants and animals in a biotic components, interacting with each other, all associated with non-living or abiotic, remember biotic is living, abiotic is non-living, components such as rock, soil, water, and climate. Ecosystems function via the cycle of matter, such as carbon or minerals, and energy flowing through those. So what is a community then? If we focused only on the interactions between the different groups of plants and animals, excluding the abiotic, the non-living component of an ecosystem, we are dealing with what we call an ecological community. So what makes up the population? Well, a population is the fundamental unit of an ecosystem through which the energy and the nutrients move through. A population is a number of individuals of the same kind living in the same area at the same time. So then what is an individual organism? Well, individual organisms are relatively independent, distinct and different from other types of organisms in a community. Individuals respond independently to the environment that they're presented. All right. So remember uh, or recall that ecosystems consist of all the living things interacting directly or indirectly in an area within their environment. Energy is considered that currency of the eco ecosystem's economy and the relationship between the living things in the ecosystem are often categorized by patterns and behaviors regarding how the energy flows through that community. community. The flow of energy is commonly uh, sorry, the flow of energy is commonly described as passing through what we call a food chain. A food chain consists of specific producers and a number of consumers that are dependent upon the availability of energy it produces. For example, a consumer which eats a producer is labeled a first order consumer. But then a consumer which eats the first order consumer, is labeled a second order consumer and so on. In reality, food chains are not as simple as a linear line, uh, but occur as a part of a bigger food web. Rabbits seldomly just eat one type of grass species, right? But they eat many other plants as well. Coyotes eat other things besides just rabbits. We all agree with that. Hawks and bobcats also eat rabbits as well and bacteria molds decompose the dead plant mi minerals or materials, sorry, the dead plant materials and the animal waste as well as animals when they die. So it's not just a line that we can just go dot, dot, dot. It's a web. Everything is interactive and interchangeable. So the underlying ecological theme involves following the energy pathways through any living ecological system from the ultimate source, which is the sun. 
uh, ecologists categorize organisms by the trophic levels. Trophic meaning food and an ecosystem. Producer, producers, which are plants, are the principal direct accumulators of that solar energy on Earth. That's very important to remember, okay? And that goes back to, go back to your water cycle and how that all impacts each other. All right, so um, are the principal direct solar on Earth. Available and transferable energy to the first, second, and third order consumers is reduced each time it's transferred. Matter of fact, it's reduced about to 90% each step it takes in that trophic level. So the food that has the most abundance of energy is that first plant that's eaten. And if an animal eats that plant, the energy that's passed into that animal decreases. And let's say that coyote eats that rabbit that ate the plant, that energy continues to decrease and so on. Okay, the amount of energy lost as heat and work is progressively declining energy relationship is ineffectively often represented by what we call the energy pyramid. And I'm just gonna leave that term out there. We'll discuss that at a later date. All right, so what are the ecological roles within an ecosystem? The way organisms go about getting food is equally as important as who eats whom. Consumers and producers relationships are usually unique and species specific. An organism which tends to exclusively eat plant, be a plant consumer is called a herbivore. Now an organism which eats flesh or other consumers is considered a carnivore. And then for those that can't decide, so some creatures will eat both plants and animals and we call them omnivores. I know for myself, I am an omnivore for sure. So some of the um, special relationships that I need to point out to you is that herbivores tend to be further categorized as grazers or browsers. And you're gonna hear that again at a later date. There's also a predator prey relationship in which one organism benefits while another is killed. So the coyote eating the rabbit would be a predator prey. If one organism benefits and the other one is harmed but not killed, that relationship is called a parasitism. Now, if one organism is benefited but the other is neither benefited, harmed, injured, or killed, that relationship is described as commensalism. If both organisms benefit from a relationship, we could describe it as a mutualism. If two species are so closely, closely ecologically intertwined and would die if separated, we are looking at the most extreme cases of symbiosis or what we call mutualism. Other things to consider are scavengers and decomposers. Let's just talk about them really quick. An essential diverse group of plants animals and fungi um, and bacteria are responsible for recycling those organisms. Two more terms I want to just put out there is we have keystone spe species. Keystone species are species that you don't often find in a particular ecological system or area, but they have made their way there because of some kind of force that's moved them out of their home range. And then we have indicator species. Now these are really important. This is kind of like the canary in a, in a mine. We use that canary to find out if there's certain things that are prevalent and necessary for survival. And miners take it down there. If there's not enough oxygen in the air, that canary dies. And that's an indicator that something is off in that ecosystem. All right, hang in there, we're almost there. All right, let's talk about competition. Uh, first, I want to say that it's important to understand that as we observe and analyze different com competitive behaviors, that we recognize subjectively or premature judgments that not all competition is good. 
and not all competition is bad. So in an ecological setting, many important relationships between these different organisms are categorized as either intra or interspecific competition. If it, the interactions are between members of the same species, just like the two monkeys at the top of that picture, uh, within a community that is called intraspecific competition. Now, reproduction, food gathering, nesting behaviors that are often unique to each species within an ecological community, they are off these interactions and competition between different species in the same space is called interspecific competition. All right. <laughs> Also, uh, we need to talk about the community structure. If a community is defined within a given area of time, how are the boundaries established or even maintained? Boundaries are probably best defined as being the most flexible part of an ecosystem. Most communities overlap in their interactions with neighboring communities. You overlap you don't just live in your house, you live in your community. Uh, you don't just stay in your yard, you may go in on, into somebody else's yard, but you're totally two different entities within that community. All right, so some species become active participants in a community and are con communities um, that are quite distant from their own communities. And then we have some that just only interact within their own communities. All right, so what is the community structures? One moment. Okay, organisms that live together in a community. These communities are usually organized in specific ways that depends on each organization's ability to adapt to the conditions created by its fellow community members or other environmental conditions. For an example, a forested area, different types of plants may occur in layers, herbs being the lowest, you got shrubs and trees forming a successively higher canopy. Another example of a community structure occurs in the aquatic system. As light penetrates the water column, there are different types of algae, aquatic plants, or aquatic animals that will flourish or disappear depending on the amount of sunlight. One important rule of thumb is as we look at biological diversity, uh, when the community increases, meaning greater amounts or types of life within that community, then so does the complexity of that community structure. Also, as environmental stress decreases, so does the complexity of the community structures. Let's think of a Arctic tundra compared to a tropical forest. The latter has more consistent environment. Hence, it also has more of a complex community structure. This is one of the reasons that riparian communities that we'll go back over in just a minute are more complex than surrounding desert areas. They are usually more constant source of water, which relieves the stress on organisms in them. So with that being said, if we step back and look at ecological communities found on Earth, we have little difficulty in seeing that there are changes which occur on a daily, a weekly, or even a monthly, yearly basis. More dramatically, if there is a major disturbance such as a fire, flood, or some human construction leaving degraded conditions behind, we observe a very slow process by nature where plants and animals return slowly to that change, uh, slowly change the disturbed areas through a series of stages, which can lead back towards the original stage or the original con condition of that ecological system. This subsequential and somewhat orderly process uh, of ecological recovery over time is called succession. Succession follows a unique pattern which might be diff different based on the larger climatic or physical characteristics of the area. Do note that typically invader species are the first to return to any area that's been disturbed. 
as supportive soils and other ecological changes start to accumulate, the complexity of the community increases. Very little in nature is static. However, plant and animal communities may change constantly over time, particularly with climate variability, such as where we live, uh, and its frequency. It's important to realize that many of these communities maintain a re are maintained by reoccurring events such as fires, floods, grazing, and other types of uh, disturbance that make it non-climax conditions. Log pole, an example would be a log pole forest which dominates the Rocky Mountains, the grassland of Central America, the sage brushes the sage scrub forest and goes on. These are all dependent on fire to reach that climax uh, position. Another example closer to home would be like your yard. Human intervention and regular mowing will maintain a yard in a relatively steady and climax or desirable state. If neglected, it would eventually become overrun with other grasses and weeds from the surrounding or natural community. Now, the appearance of weeds marks the beginning of a new stage of succession in that community, which may or may not be desirable. All right, now we're gonna talk about ecological settings. Take a deep breath, here we go. Biotic communities exist within the context of that abiotic, non-living environment and the environmental conditions of the biotic which support plants and animals. Okay, everybody understand that? All right, the, the environmental conditions of each biotic community support particular plants and animals. Each plant, for example, has an upper limit or altitude or elevation in which it'll thrive. If the elevation is too wet or too cold for that plant to grow, it will die. But if it's too low where it's too hot or too dry, that plant may not survive either. So it's really important when we're looking at topography, which we talked about a couple sessions ago, um, that we look at the aspects of each land formation. Now this is, and this uh, will not be any news to you once we start talking about that. Okay, so depending on the direction in which any slope in a topography falls, it can modify the effects of temperatures. So southwest facing slopes or mountainsides are warm by exposed to the full sunlight during the hottest part of the day. Agree? But the northeast facing slopes are cooler since they receive less direct sunlight. A good example of this is merely look across a valley and notice that on some hillsides, there's trees and shrubs and cacti or, and other grasses that are taller and quite different from other areas. This is probably due to the direction or the slope, the direction that the slope faces and the amount of heat, light and water it receives because of that aspect. Warmer slopes will also be drier. Keep that in mind. Warmer slopes are also drier. So you're, um, your easterly direction tend to be a little drier. All right, so living organisms, regarding, regardless of their level of biological sophistication or presumed importance by humans, play a very significant role in the ecological direction. Success or failure of an ecosystem is based on abiotic factors that play an equally important role. Climate, weather, soils, water, winds, temperatures, are just a few of the abiotic factors that we tend to take for granted when we see a beautiful forest, a beautiful prairie, or a herd of antelope. Yet these are the very factors which make it possible to have them there and for them to survive. Three more important concepts I wanna talk about on this slide is um, niche, habitat, and range. A niche, is a way an organism occupies its environment. Where species are found and have physical environment that it requires, it has a habitat. An organism's home range is the distance a species can move within a given environment. And the physical environmental conditions influence an organism's range. So I, my 
way of thinking about this, let's say that we all have a niche, okay? Some of you guys, your niche is basketball. Some of you, your niche is art. Some of you, your niche is computers. And as species, and that's our niche or our desire, we tend to hang out with other people of like mind. Now, once we find that, if I want to be a good basketball player, where will the other basketball players or the other species of net basketball players be hanging out? Well, that's gonna be the gymnasium, okay? So that's your habitat. That's what helps you grow to be a really good basketball player. But now if you leave that habitat and go into undesirable areas, such as taking your basketball out of the gymnasium and bouncing it all the way down the hallway and into the lunchroom, you have then gone outside of your home range, outside of the desirable areas in which somebody wants you to be bouncing a basketball. So if you think about it in your own life, we all have our niche, we all have our habitat, and we all have our home range. All right, and lastly, I want to mention the uh, term that we frequently use, an ecological site. What is an ecological site? Well, it's a combination of biotic and abiotic characteristics in a particular location. While it has some of the qualities of an ecosystem, it also takes in account slope, aspect, climates, nutrients, soil type, water, and so on. When scientists discuss management of an ecosystem, they often study a particular ecological site just to gain a baseline for the understanding of the whole ecosystem. It's really difficult to study an entire ecosystem. So we just look at small parts of it. All right. So how are we doing on time? I think we're doing pretty good. Here we go. Uh, the last part of this presentation, I just want to talk about um, ecosystems, riparians, and wetlands. Okay, when we talk about water quality and quantity, as well as dur duration, uh, may determine the type of aquatic ecosystems in, that we live in. Some examples of these ecosystems would be ponds, pools, lakes, reservoir springs, rivers, riparian areas, wetlands, irrigation canals, and stock tanks. So the term riparian is used as an inclusive term to describe the areas adjacent to any water body. The term wetland is used as an exclusive term to describe an area which frequently and frequently subject to persistent flooding or in close proximity to elevated groundwater. There are transitional ecosystems that demonstrate characteristics and life forms associated with both terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems. Both riparian areas and wetlands occur naturally or may be produced by human or particular activities. All right, so what is a riparian? Well, riparian or water bodies at the heart of a watershed are really just the products of processes. Individual events or land use practices across a watershed dictate those water bodies. Okay, so in other words, the health of a water body is a telling part of a report card for the rest of the watershed. That said, another key indicator for a watershed is the watershed health is the state of a riparian areas within them. Go back to that canary we just talked about, like canaries in a coal mine, the presence or the absence of healthy strands of vegetation or animals dependent upon them indicate whether there's sufficient clean water as a whole system. Okay, let me, I'm, if you're confused on that, let me restate that. If you think about the canaries in the coal mine and then think about an ecosystem or a riparian, the presence or the absence of uh, healthy strands of vegetation and animals are dependent upon them indicating whether there is sufficient clean water in that system as a whole. Right, parent centers are the centers of biological diversity, diversity of life. That means that the diversity of life is often the greatest in association with these three ecosystems. The drier the surrounding landscape, the more distinct the riparian zone. Okay, in the desert or the grassland, a flowing stream 
and its adjacent riparian area supports, let's say, supports a conspicuous oasis within the forest in which the wildlife can drink from, um, is which you would not find otherwise in that area. Even in higher elevation biotic communities, their riparian area often can be distinguished from surrounding plant communities by a greater abundance of deciduous trees and shrubs. All right, let's move on to the next slide. So, a few more terms here and we're almost done. All right, so riparian areas actually only occupy about 2% of the total land area in the United States. Ecosystems are often the most productive and valuable of all these lands. That's where we want to live. That's where the plants want to live. That's where the animals want to live. That's where the algae or the bacteria want to live. Vertebrate animals are dependent upon these riparian areas for some portion of their life cycles, such as breeding, nesting, migrating, that kind of stuff. Um, riparian animals also provide great habitats and allow travel corridors for many mammals, including deer, rabbits, elk. Some other species that depend upon the riparian areas uh, for most of their life also include like the otter, uh, raccoon, beaver, muskrats, uh, even other mammals such as bats, also found in the riparian areas uh, because of the increased cover and food availability. I thought this was an interesting um, fact that I'd like to share with you. Did you know beavers are particularly important for a riparian area in that they may create small or large scale uh, changes within adjacent water bodies by damming it? By damming it, they can cause flooding or they can slow water flood waters from decreasing or they can increase the amount of water that infiltrates the neighboring landscape. They're also responsible for collecting silts and fine sediments that are often held back by the beaver dams, which contru uh, contribute to improve water qualities. So beavers are thought to be responsible for the formation and the maintenance of many of our original wetlands. I thought that was a cool little piece of fact. For humans, riparian areas provide important recreational opportunities uh, such as hiking, picnicking, fishing, bird watching, hunting, all of that uh, is done in within a riparian. For thousands of years, riparian areas have provided medicine, food, and building materials for many different societies in different regions. As late as the 1930s, riparian areas provided wood for the construction and fuel. And many of these activities have had an economic or economically important. Let me give you an example. Fishing alone is an $85 million a year industry. $85 million. So having healthy riparians are really important to um, recreational uh, endeavors. So riparian areas are sites of great dynamic functions where hydrologic water related or ge geologic and ecological factors come together to influence the type of life in them. Another way of thinking of a riparian area is areas of interaction between terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems, as well as between bottomlands and upland landscapes. And matter of fact, if you look at that picture at the front or at the top of the slide, you can see the difference between the floodplain, the channel, the upland, the terrace. And this might or usually shows up on a test somewhere. So keep that in mind. Uh, so the characteristics of a riparian vegetation, the types of distribution and other attributes of it uh, either directly or indirectly can provide key functions and building blocks for fish and wildlife habitats. And it's really important to the water quality. So if you look at the key riparian functions, I'm not going to read all those to you, but I'm going to highlight a couple. Contributing large wood that creates pools and hiding cover for some fish and micro uh, invertebrates. That's key. If you're a fisherman, one of the first things you look for is for a downed tree 
or some log that's at the bottom of a lake and you know that's a great habitat for fish and it's a great habitat for macro and bird roast. so that's a good way of understanding water quality okay uh providing various microclimates uh accommodate many types of wildlife once again wildlife if that's your thing whether you were taking pictures or you're hunting or you just want to view them you want these microclimates because the more the better and the healthier the microclimates are the more wildlife you're going to be able to see aquatic habitats and terrestrial habitats are essential as key indicators of good water quality and i know benita talked to you about the chemical side of aquatics um we'll be talking more about that at a later date we're almost there guys uh, I thought this would be a good place to let you know that there is a difference between lakes and streams. Um, lakes tend to retain water for long periods of time, whether it's for days, months, or years, where streams tend to be constantly moving, okay? Uh, this is important to understand when you're looking for different microorganisms and you're looking at different water qualities. Here's another little piece of information. I'm not going to read these to you, but I didn't know there were so many different types of lakes until I started putting this together. I heard a few of these lakes. I knew what an oxbow lake was. I knew what a beaver made lake was, uh, a glacial lake, but I didn't understand there was a volcanic lake or landslide lake. So I just thought this was good information to add to your repertoire. All right. Uh, in future presentations, we're going to start looking at what does it mean or what are the structures of upland areas? This is really important to understand. Remember when we were talking about watersheds and we said we had to look at land uses to understand um, the what the topography is being used for and what the, the ecology of that area is based on that land use. That's why we have to look at aerial maps, topography maps, or even go out and ground truth. So you'll be hearing more about that in the future as well. All right, last thing I'm gonna talk about, and then we're gonna go on to Kahoot. Uh, human impacts, they're huge, absolutely huge on our ecosystems. As humans, we want what we want, right? And we all, we as humans, have, we all live in a watershed. We already established that early on. And we want our cars, we want our jobs, we want our industries, we want our recreation, we want our clean water, but we also want water to use to wash our cars. Okay, so there's a lot of human impacts that will shift a watershed ecology and will shift what kind of organisms what kind of animals, what kind of plants live or thrive within uh, that watershed? Remember, as humans, we tend to want to put non-permeable sites. Uh, it's humans that in usually introduce uh, non-point source pollution to our water, as well as point source pollution to our water uh, that has the greatest impacts uh, on our water quality. <coughs> All right. So I know I threw a lot of stuff at you in these last few minutes. So what I thought I would do is I gave you a list of words to know, all right? These are all the words that we talked about uh, during this presentation and a few of these words that we talked about in previous presentation. This would be a great way to go through this presentation and make sure that you understand what all these words mean. All right. Also, I have two ideas for you to get a better understanding. I suggest that you go and watch the uh, Aquatic Science Lessons by Dr. Rudy Rosen. Uh, he has a curriculum and it's arranged in three, 13 lessons. I enjoyed listening to him, I think you would too. And then of course, I wanna remind you that we have the EPA Watershed Academy. Hopefully, when you go to the Watershed Academy, they may they will present this information just a little bit differently than I did. But understanding this presentation will give you a great understanding when you start reading the Academy's information. <laughs>